everyone, and welcome back to another Victober video. And I am really delighted to show you this interview today. Uh, and welcome to Dr. Kylie Ann Hingston. Thank you so much for joining me for this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to talk about Victorian literature today. <laughs> Yes, it is just uh, endlessly rich in all of the angles and aspects that you can discover within it. Um, and would you be willing to give uh, some of your background? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of English at uh, St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatchewan uh, on Treaty 6 land in the homeland of the Métis in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, my uh, main area of study is, of course, Victorian literature, and I focus on disability in Victorian literature and culture. Uh, and I, um, I also teach, in addition to teaching Victorian literature, I teach children's literature, which is actually what got me into Victorian literature. I was uh, study Vic children's literature first, and um, so much. Uh, well, I was interested in disability in children's literature, and so much disability in children's literature is in Victorian literature, or literature deeply uh, influenced or embedded, um, has Victorian literature embedded in it. So, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> oh, thank you. And that's actually a great segue, because the first question I wanted to talk about was your introduction to Victorian literature. So was yeah. it um, when you were looking into more children's literature, was that kind of in your undergrad you were studying for that or was it just for leisure kind of your it, reading that you were doing? It was, um, well, in studying, in studying Victorian literature, it was in my master's program. I focused on disability in Lucy Maud Montgomery's writing. She wrote Anne of Green Gables and, yes. um, and, uh, you know, so much of her, I mean, her write, her, she started writing just right at the tail end of the Victorian era, era I suppose, but so much of her writing references uh, Victorian literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to read the Victorian literature to uh, understand what she was getting at. And, mm. um, and yeah, I loved it. <laughs> so, uh, so when I went on to do my doctorate, I switched to a Victorian studies focus and uh, looked at disability in that. Yeah. Wow. So I, um, I'm i thinking, what are some of the, because I'm drawing a blank on some of the Victorian literature that she references um, in her works. Sure. That's interesting to me. Sure. Well, um, there's, um, in Emily of New Moon in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Jane Eyre plays a really important role. Wow. Um, there's, uh, a lot of parallels between Jane and Emily uh, and different experiences they had, such as, um, I don't know if uh, you've read Emily of New Moon or have read it recently and would remember, but uh, there's uh, an inc incident where she's locked in a room and that's mm -hmm. uh, parallel to wow. Jane Eyre being locked in the room when she was a child too. And, um, and Dean Priest in particular, um, makes a lot of parallels between um, himself and Rochester and her and Jane. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that is one of the ones that comes to mind. Oh, very interesting. Um, yes, so then kind of what can you recall the first Victorian novel that you loved and you thought, wow, I want more of this. This is amazing. Um, hmm, I, it's, it's really odd that I, I can't remember specifically which one I loved. I, uh, when I was in sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher read us uh, A Christmas Carol Aloud at Christmas oh. time. And that had a big impact on me for sure. Um, I read Great Expectations as an undergrad, but I, I cannot, I honestly cannot remember my first impression of it. It's one of my favorite books now, but, um, and, and then there's Jane Eyre. Uh, that one I do remember loving immediately, but perhaps because it's one I read in my master's degree, which was more recent than the, than the <laughs> earlier ones. But um, yeah, yeah, I would say one of those three, if, if not all of them, I guess. Yes. Yeah, it's funny because I, I think back sometimes <clears throat> in, in with reading memories and I'm like, I can't actually remember how I felt 
the first time I read that book, but I've returned to it multiple times. So I know I, I liked it well enough yeah. to keep going. Uh, so then in the uh, kind of now as a, a professor interacting with your students or just maybe in popular culture, mm -hmm. have you found any common misconceptions about Victorian literature? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I was in a, a Twitter conversation recently about this kind of thing. Uh, there's there's a, 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 a misconception about the Victorian era in general uh, that often gets put upon the literature as well. And that's the idea that Victorians were entirely prudish or like that sex was completely like almost non-existent somehow <laughs> in, in the Victorian era. And um, so, so my students are often surprised how sexy <laughs> Victorian literature can be, even though they are not mentioning or describing sex overtly, that, that it's still sexy. And um, yeah, so I think that's probably the most, most common misconception that gets blown open in um, the classes that, that I teach. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it, it is funny um, because obviously the population carried on throughout the Victorian era. <laughs> yeah. So people were not celibate. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yes. And also, I, I do wonder if part of the, uh, what contributes to that could be that the pictures that we have, <clears throat> people are doing these big smiles, which I know Americans in particular, we love like a cheesy big grin um, for, for a picture, for a photograph. Uh, but also they had to sit for so much longer to, you know, have the photo be taken. Um, and I think it was just a, a different idea of, you know, um, maybe the rarity of having uh, pictures taken. Uh, it was a more solemn occasion. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So then within Victorian literature, what do you think it is about it that makes it unique and special. And even though it's, you know, 150 now getting, you know, 200 years old, depending on when in the era it was published, it still feels vibrant and like you can learn something new from it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for me, I would say that the thing I like most about Victorian literature and the thing that keeps bringing me back to it uh, is its stress on interconnection really, um, particularly uh, connection even with people you don't know. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of Dickens in particular, who's always bringing those like wacky coincidences and things like that. And, um, but, uh, but it's not just Dickens, like, uh, they all did it, like, the, the, you know, showed the way that, um, you know, someone, someone who's um, wealthy and in parliament is connected to someone who's completely destitute in a rural area or um, connections even uh, across the world that, uh, you know, there's there's these slight mentions of, of empire in particular in, in all the novels. So it's, it's um, you know, that's why they're so big and so, so long. Uh, I think Henry James called them the loose baggy monster. And it's that they're, that they're, um, that they're making all of these connections and uh, showing how they exist and, and showing how uh, individual actions of individual people affect at such an enormous level. Mm. Uh, and I think that is something that we can always learn from. And um, I would say maybe even the other thing that largely draws me to Victorian literature, especially early and mid-Victorian literature, it's maybe less so the later we get, uh, is, is this great sense of hope uh, in, in a lot of the novels, hope that, um, that things can change and that, that people can change things in the world around them, that people can change themselves. That to me uh, is very comforting. And, and that's a large reason why I return to Victorian novels again and again. I really, I really resonate with that. And um, just kind of your choices really do matter and can have a ripple yeah. effect. Yeah. And I, I've heard recently, uh, which I really appreciate that something you can do to make a, a noble act you can do to make a tragic situation 
um, less tragic. That's that's a very noble thing to do. Um, mm. And yeah, there's a lot of characters who are very um, selfless in their actions. And I'm thinking of, um, of course, uh, Ham in David Copperfield. Um, yeah. That that will always just really pull tug at my heartstrings. Um, and yeah, just uh, life is very unfair and challenging. And so I think it feels inspiring to read about these characters who didn't exist, but they feel so real <laughs> if they are written well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so then with teaching Victorian literature to your students, um, kind of, I'm wondering what do they tend to like about Victorian literature, tend to dislike about it? Right, that's a, a good question. Um, dislikes are probably easier for me to talk <laughs> about. <laughs> Uh, because of like you know, I referred to the loose baggy monsters. They dislike how long they are, <laughs> uh, and they often dislike the syntax, like that mm. the sentences are are long and um, hard to track in a lot of ways. Um, so those those are the things that they dislike. But uh, at the same time. Um, students often end up falling in love with that too. <laughs> like they they begin disliking that or anticipating disliking that, but, um, you know, enter into the world of the Victorian novel and get to like it there, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what they seem to like the most is uh, the social concerns that the novels are um, are focusing on or, or bringing to attention. Uh, for example, um, you know, I think uh, I often teach North and South and oh. um, by Elizabeth Gaskell, and uh, they're interested in in the the ways the novel is sort of challenging classisms, um, showing ways that uh, that even sort of religious structures are being challenged, and um, yeah, ideas about what what a woman should be. Uh, at that time were even being challenged uh, and you know and that's a, you know in, in many ways it's a relatively conservative text and yet it's still it's still um, calling for social progress and um, yeah and that's something that they enjoy engaging with and you know I go from that and to um, A Woman in White by Wilkie Collins which mm -hmm. you know it's challenging law. It's challenging um, a binary gender. It's it, like it's it, it's engaging with things that uh, that we're still trying to figure out today, and um, and that's really exciting for students to see that mm. uh, that these issues have been. Um, have been discussed and examined for so for so long. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thinking about how you know the the length does seem to be a big obstacle, but how you said then it ends up that they'll kind of like it by the end, and that's it's uh you know it's a blessing and a curse the the length yeah. of Victorian novels because it is harder to get people to be willing to to dive in. Uh, yeah. But I love the length about yeah. them because um, I feel the the long books really sink into your soul mm -hmm. um, in a way that the, there are some, you know, special gems, but they really do have a way of uh, being really uh, memorable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I don't know, I kind of compare it in a way to the, um, those really long fantasy series where it's like a bazillion books long, you know, it, it's, it's, um, you know, in fantasy, it's world building and in, Victorian literature, uh, it's it's world building, but it's realism. Yes. And uh, well, it's mostly realism. Not everything is realism, obviously. But um, yeah, and I think yeah, being able to just lose yourself in a in a world that is different is um, is cool. <laughs> yes. And enjoyable, and I think that's that that once students get past the length and the syn syntax. They can get into the world. Yes. Yeah. The the Victorian dialect. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So then um, <clears throat> is there a book in general that typically most students by the end are like, okay, I'm, I'm glad I read this? Or is it in general, most of the books, they feel like they're glad that they read? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I'm trying to think of the the various books I've taught. And I think I think it probably it can change over the years too. It depends on the class. Like I once uh, taught Bleak House to a class of undergrads and uh, they ended up just really liking it. Oh, wow. uh, and then I taught it recently in a graduate course and they really did not like it. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's really funny. <laughs> it is, but it and it just happened that uh this the the um students I was was teaching they were mostly modernists, so they you know to them like the absolute appeal of is like that sort of precise unified text and and Bleak House is just this blobby mess. So brawling, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do, I'm actually rereading Bleak House currently. And um, one of my, the thing that I love and I hate about it is it's, I, I have certain characters that I love and I just want to spend all of those chapters yeah. with those characters. <laughs> and then it's, oh, no, we're going to take a detour and let's talk more about Jarndyce and Jarndyce. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the story enough that I'm, I'm generally content to be, to be riding the wave. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, now I think my favorite out of out of his, it's tied between David Copperfield or Dombey and Son, which mm. I would never have picked Dombey and Son up as soon as I did were it not for um, one of the Victober co-hosts, Katie, her oh, channel is Books and Things. She loves Dombey and Son. And I'm so glad that she talked it up because it's so, it has the same kind of, warmth and sentimental feel uh, as David Copperfield while also having some kind of deliciously dark plot lines mm -hmm. that together just make this beautiful concoction. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, my favorites I think are are typically his later his later stuff. So uh, Bleak House and Our Mutual Friend I think are are my favorites. And yet I I I teach Oliver Twist, which is one of his very early ones. That's one I, I often teach. Um, and yeah, uh, students are really intrigued by it as well because it is so, it's it's even more different, I think, from modern literature in a lot of ways than, um, than his later novels. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I actually, even though I typically tend to like his later books more, but Oliver Twist, there's something about it. I don't know. I I'll, I know Oliver is a totally kind of one-dimensional, angelic <laughs> little, little child, but I still am rooting for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's in Oliver Twist, too, where he talks about um, how he uses that phrase streaky bacon to describe the the moving between like the the sort of thick sad sentimental and the kind of comedy and 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 that kind of thing and um i i bring that that metaphor back every time i teach dickens and point out his his streaky bacon <laughs> um yeah oh and i, I like that yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, I do gen in general, I prefer, you know, Gaskell or Elliot kind of over yeah. Dickens, but I do wish, you know, I feel like Elizabeth Gaskell has kind of, she has lots of variety within her books. Like you can read this kind of book or this kind of book, but that book kind of sticks to, it stays in its corner and doesn't mm -hmm. branch out from that. So that is something that d makes Dickens pretty unique. Um, yeah out of yeah. a different Victorian yeah. authors. He really hybridizes genre uh, I, in a way that, yeah, Gaskell or or even Eliot don't really do. Yeah. Yes, yes. Then uh, I felt a little bit um, in Anthony Trollope's Can You Forgive Her? He has a darker plot line, which I was very surprised by that, that Trollope would put something like that in there. But I was like, oh, this is feeling a bit more like a Dickens, you know, having <laughs> such a, uh, I don't know, such a uh, 
not paradox. I don't know what I'm trying to think, but very different kinds of atmospheres to different yes. parts of the novel. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Trollope has a has a few of those. I sort of feel like like not a lot. Like he's, you know, you can recognize a Trollope novel when you, when you read a Trollope novel. Uh, but I feel like, um, oh dear, what's it called? I can only think of the actors who played it. Oh, <laughs> the way we live now. Yes, yes, that's it. Like that one, it feels so, um, so much darker as well than, than yes. he usually gets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and also, you know, he's going to, he's going to talk to you a lot. He's going to give asides to you <laughs> quite yeah. a bit. Um, so then um, the way I found you through the interwebs, uh, <laughs> you talked about you were very interested on disabil disability being represented in Victorian literature. And the two, two of the main authors uh, for that would be Charlotte Mary Young and Dinah Mullet Craik. And uh, I read Olive by Dinah Mullet Craik and I liked it, but I didn't love it. Yeah. And then last year, stumbled on the little lame prince at a library book sale and was completely charmed by it yeah. i really have come to love fairy tales and mythology and so i thought why don't i give this one a try it's okay. a really different kind of um device to use and i just really really loved it this story of it starts out with tragedy you know he's dropped as an infant <laughs> very dramatic um, and then you think, where is this story going to go? And I think kind of the only thing uh, to make it not as tragic as as a Thomas Hardy is to put in a fairy godmother in this magic traveling cloak. Um, so I just, I was so blown away by it. So you said, have you done writing on it, did you say? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I um, I wrote uh, an article and a chapter on on Little Lane Prince and disability in Little Lane Prince, and um, it's interesting that you said that you're you're interested in fairy tale or getting interested in fairy tales. Uh, Craig was really interested in fairy tales, and okay. she wrote um, they're sort of translations, but almost adaptations of um, of uh, French fairy tales, like by Perrault and uh, uh, oh, wow. Dalnoy, and uh, and they're really interesting. And um, a Craig was, uh, of course, really interested in disability as well. Uh, she um, and so even even in the her translation slash adaptations of fairy tales, she brings out these themes of of disability or physical difference. Uh, quite a bit and, and in really interesting ways. So I recommend uh, if you can get your hands on on her, uh, Google Books definitely has her okay. kind of translations of these fairy tales. They're really interesting wow. as well. Um, so as I mentioned that Craig was interested in disability and I, I feel like I should give a little bit of extra context as well. So at least um, uh, definitely by the time she was writing Little Lane Prince, uh, she'd been married for some time she because she references her daughter that she had adopted uh, as narrator she references the daughter uh, and her her husband was disabled by uh, a train accident which is actually how they uh, they fell in love she was caring for him after the the train accident um, it, it there's an excellent biography uh, by uh, Karen Bourier of Dinah Mullet Craig that I that I recommend. It is worth reading that that uh, talks about all this. Uh, but she'd already been really interested in um, in disability and invalidism as well. Uh, prior to that, um, her first big hit is uh, John Halifax, Gentleman. Have you heard of that one or read that I one? I, I read part of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and it's it's narrated by um, by a man with a disability. Uh, so, anyways, with Little Lame Prince, uh, this is so funny. I've digressed so much. I forget your original question. About Little no, Lame I just wanted to hear kind of your general thoughts on the Little oh. Lame Prince. So it's, it's all interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, Little Lame Prince. It's a really different kind of uh, disability fairy tale, uh, especially from other ones that I've read that uh, in that time period as well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
often it's like a um so often especially in children's literature uh the the lesson that you're supposed to learn you know you're always supposed to learn a lesson from from the disabled person and typically you're what the lesson you're supposed to learn is like how to have pluck and how to um <laughs> you know, even now we still have those stories of disability, right? We have that idea of overcoming your disability, which, uh, yes. you know, and, and a lot of um, people with disabilities and disability activists kind of push against that because it's, you know, it's not the disability people have to overcome. It's typically the prejudices about disability or the environmental barriers uh, that people have to overcome. Yes. And I think that uh, what's really different about Little Lane Prints too is that, um, it really acknowledges the social, uh, mm -hmm. the social they're not consequences, the social causes and um, uh, experience of disability, right? So the reason he's exiled um, and the reason he's so easily exiled is that his kingdom sees his disability as like representative of um, the body the body politic. He, he, if if a king can't stand, he can't be mm. a good king. Uh, and um, obviously, by the end of the story, he shows what an amazing king he is, right? Mm. And yeah. and um, and in the end, like his his body has a different signif signification to the kingdom. They hear his crutch, and it's uh, and it like reminds them of of his good kingness essentially that he's that he's good at that mm -hmm. uh his isolation that he experiences uh in the tower you know it's it's because you know his uncle wants him out of the way so his uncle can have the kingdom but even with the the cloak um i think it's i think it might even be the fairy grandmother sort of explains to him that he can't play how other boys play yes and um and that because of that, he will be excluded. Mm. And, and at the same time, Dinah Craig shows how very active and playful he is, even as a little lame prince. Like yeah. she describes him actively moving around the room. So it shows, you know, just he moves differently, but he could still play. He could still have that, that social connection, but it's barred from him because of the social expectations. Mm. So, um, yeah, just the, the way that Crake, in, in all of her novels about disability, and, and um, as she wrote some nonfiction about it as well, mm. it, she's she's thinking about disability in, in really much more complex ways than, than a lot of, um, you know, than, than, than from this sort of typical uh, tropes of disability she she really challenges and plays with those tropes in in interesting ways so yeah yeah I really I pre appreciate how in the story you very much empathize with the the prince but you don't pity him yeah um yeah. you you want better for him it but I'm not oh I want his legs to be fixed that's not how I yes. you know I, yeah. like you said the isolation and what a I mean putting him in a tower how how much more if, you know unless he was just plopped in the desert or something it's yeah. just such a really um effective device to have there and so then with the fairy godmother and the traveling cloak it's I don't know it's really interesting to me because he still doesn't have the use of his legs like your able-bodied person but um the traveling cloak once his, it's like his whole world expands and he's he's able to see more um but kind of then he becomes um discontent with how he is kind of embracing his role as prince after seeing the wider world that he is is technically ruling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's what it it's what makes him active as well it's interesting it, I, I hadn't really thought of this before but it uh, it just shows how important access is, right? Like, yes, he didn't need his legs to be fixed. He just needed access to that, um, to his kingdom, to the outside world. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. You for and putting it that way, it helped me to think of that. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm glad. Yeah, it, it was just, it really struck me when I 
when I read it. And, and then again, you know, the resolution at the end is a uh, sort of spoilers for anyone, but uh, is not that, you know, his laser fix. It's that he more access, then he doesn't need the cloak anymore um, yeah. is crutches. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's a really beautiful story. It's really yeah. moving. Yeah. So I'm planning on this Victober reading it aloud to my nine-year-old and five-year-old and I'm hoping they'll like it and the copy I have uh has lots of illustrations so I'm very excited to share it with them yeah I hope they like it <laughs> I hope so and yeah hopefully it helps them grow in empathy um and and kindness from listening to it uh so then the other author that disability is just represented in spades in her books and pretty much every one of her books is Charlotte Mary Young mm -hmm. um and I remember the first time, the first book I read by her was The Heir of Redcliffe. Oh, and I thought, what is this? Here is this, you know, Dickens, bless his heart. You know, I do love a lot about his books, but he doesn't have the greatest disability representation um, in his books. And then also Wilkie Collins. I don't know if you have read The Law and the Lady. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The disability representation in that book is terrible. I love that book. Um, but... I feel like the, uh, I can't remember, oh, Ozymand, it's like Ozymandias or something. Um, his, his, he's kind of animal-like in the way that he is presented. Um, so then to come to the heir of Redcliffe and uh, now it's funny, the, there are so many character names floating around in my head. Is it Charles? Is he the brother? That is lame. Um. It's so funny. It's I, yeah. I'm like, there's, I want to say Edmund something, but yeah, it's uh, been too long. So <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. No, that's uh, quite all right. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the brother's name, but go on. But yes, so what a nuanced portrayal uh, there. You know, he's not, it's not like he's thrilled about the fact that he doesn't have mobility, but he doesn't consider himself to be less of a full human being because of that. Um, and it was, it was just, it's really a breath of fresh air. And it honestly feels like wonderful disability representation, even for now. It's just, mm -hmm. there's something really special about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, I have to defend Wilkie Collins. Okay. <laughs> I am I am open to hearing it. Yes. Uh, oh, Wilkie Collins himself sort of uh, he identified as being physically different as well. He had uh, um, what he considered a, a sort of facial deformity and he really? had like a lump uh, on his forehead. And huh. um, and he wrote a ton about disability. And uh, like with, with Law and the Lady too, that one is, is tricky. Like um, I haven't written about about Law and the Lady, and it's been a while since I've read it as well. But there's there's some really great articles out, out there about mm. um, about the the way Wilkie Collins is just challenging the idea of what is normal, or or like or the concept of normal in general. He's he he pushes against those boundaries, especially in Law and the Lady, with the two disabled characters. Um, I'm forgetting his name as well. I think Miseremus and oh, uh, that's right, Miseremus. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. So I would say I would say they're 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 more nuanced, but uh, even though the the portrayal it seems negative, especially in that book, that there's more nuance and um, interesting. And like, I mean, it, have you ever read Poor Miss Finch? Yes. Yes. So yeah, that's one of those ones where he was like really determined to push against a uh, typical, you know, the, the blind heroine in, in most Victorian novels is like the pathetic boo who you feel so sad for her. Kind yes. of thing. And he just with poor Miss Finch, he is trashing that he's like, no, this yes. is like this powerful, confident blind woman. And, um, Anyway, so so that is true. Collins does have nuance, but I think that what you're picking up on with with Charlotte Mary Young, or Young, sorry, I always mispronounce her last name, uh, is that um, you know, whereas whereas Wilkie Collins is kind of pushing against what normalness is in general, uh, Charlotte Mary Young is like, no, uh, disability is completely normal. Disability mm. is completely common, uh, you know, and um, 
there's uh, what I love about uh, her, her representations of disability um, is that it's just so every day. Like it's it's you know it's sad that um, what is her name Margaret can't walk anymore after the accident in Daisy Chain. Mm -hmm. It's sad, but it's not it's not the end of the world. It's not this um, totally. I mean, it is a tragedy. It affects her marriage or her marriage potential and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's still just you just adapt and she's still a central part of the family. It's not like she's suddenly not her or uh, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, she, uh, she, she seems to stress the possibility of not just the possibility, just the, um, that like whole integration of people with disabilities into society is entirely possible and and should be expected rather than being this um exception to the rule yes yeah and something else i i appreciate about her uh representations of disability is she acknowledges uh she acknowledges the way money changes the experience of disability oh so cuz um because access is expensive, you know, yes. like um, uh, in Pillars of the House. Um, oh, I haven't read this one, but I've heard it enormous. Heard it <laughs> is it really? It was, I want to say six or eight volumes long. Like it was enormous, but Whoa. a delight, uh, an really? absolute delight to read. So a must read then. I, I would say so. <laughs> I, okay. I put it up there. Um the the it, it's a story of sort of rags to riches for for this whole okay. family and many of the characters in the family are, are are disabled and uh the one character at the beginning that um when they are poor it's it's commented on how how she can't get that much access to the outside world because it is expensive to rent a chair they mm. can't afford a chair to to take her out um and uh eventually she gets an operation uh, that means she can use a crutch and it means she has more access and um yeah just just it it acknowledges that um that financial restraint or or financial well-being is going to is going to affect those things as well um wow which i think is is really cool that she yeah. pays attention to those things that is really interesting to think about. And um, I'm thinking too, uh, have you read Deerbrook by Harriet Martineau? I'm in the middle of it, actually. <laughs> Are you? Oh my goodness. So yes, there's a character um, <clears throat> with disability in that book. And it's yeah. interesting because her financial status definitely affects her experience. And Harriet Martineau herself um was disabled and yeah. I started and didn't finish not because I didn't like it I just got distracted by all the things uh but I, I think it's notes from the sick room and it's her just yeah. writing on her experience with with chronic illness and thankfully she was uh fairly financially stable and so yeah. she talks about how um how uh nourishing to the soul it can be to be in the outdoors and so Mm -hmm. the thing you would you know she I think she had a chair where she was able to be kind of uh taken to the outdoors yeah. Um, yeah and then a note on kind of disability is every day I hadn't thought of it that way so that's so interesting uh have you read Charlotte Mary Young's The Three Brides that's one I haven't read no okay it's really interesting in that one because one of the sons in it is albino and it's commented on once or twice. And he's even, um, he's a curate. Um, and then you just move on with the book. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It just shows the everydayness of it for sure. Like it's something to mention and move on or uh, yes. it comes up when it comes up. Um, yes. Like I thinking of Cherry in uh, Pillars of the House again, you know, uh, to get to church that they like have to carry her up the stairs you know they like oh. mention little little moments of like access and then uh 
and then move on. It's it's just everyday life. Yeah. Now, to your knowledge, did she have, because I don't think she was disabled herself. Did she have a close family member that was? I don't know enough about her, her biography. I haven't read a, a full biography, just the sort of Oxford uh, Dictionary National Biography. So I'm not really sure where her uh, her interest in in disability comes from. Um, yeah, I would have to look into that more. It could just be that, you know, just in the community she lived in, there could have been a number of people with disabilities, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, it's yes. a good question and one I should find out the answer to. <laughs> uh, so then I, I'm just thinking about kind of more um, characters in Victorian literature. I guess I'm thinking of is it Jenny Wren. Is that her name in uh, Our Mutual Friend? What, what do you think is kind of uh, how kind of uh, good of a representation is it of her in there? Um, yeah, there's been, uh, I, I haven't written on our mutual friend and it was honestly be almost because it's, it's almost too difficult to figure out. <laughs> it's, uh, like the, the, one of the bits of disability representation in it that fascinates me is this character gruff and grim, I think is what he, he calls mm -hmm. them that's in one scene and it's a double peg legged, um, sailor. Mm -hmm. And, and then you just, he's there to sort of distract you momentarily so that you don't, uh, that you don't figure out the mystery of, um, Boffin in, in oh. particular. And, um, anyway, so Jenny Wren in particular, um, I'm trying to think of what I've read from, from other scholars as well about Jenny Wren's disability. And, uh, one, one notes, um, one or two really interesting readings about how uh, Jenny Wren is sort of what enables um, the romance between Lizzie Hexham and Eugene. Uh, Eugene. Yeah, and that it's also uh, once Eugene becomes a disabled subject himself through the extreme violence that um, that that's when they mm. uh, become united as well. Um, yeah, Jenny Wren is such an interesting, interesting character, uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to make of her, uh, and it's, a, it's, again, it's because it is, it is really complex and nuanced that she calls herself Jenny Wren, but that's not her name, and, um, she's always drawing attention to her, her poor back, but not in like a pity me way, but like in an explanation way. Mm. I can't get to the door quickly because of my back. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's one I think I need to come back to again. I think maybe what I should do is, is teach it because I find that what yeah. students, what students pull out um, is so enlightening to me. So mm -hmm. maybe that's where I will, uh, finally figure out what's going on with disability in our mutual yeah. <laughs> well yeah. and I think that would be such a, a a perk kind of of being in academia if there's a book that you're like I'd really like to unpack that more assigning it in a class and then you can really kind of chew on it and uh, yeah. think about yeah. it yeah that's true and then another character that comes to mind is uh I'm pretty sure her name is Margaret uh in Mary Barton um, her friend, her good friend who sings. Have you, I don't know if you've read it recently. I have read, but it was a long time ago. I'm remembering blindness in Mary Barton. Yes. Yes. So remember. she, um, yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. I'm going to make sure to put banners in here, you know, spoiler for Mary Barton coming, uh, <laughs> but because she becomes blind in the novel. Right. Um, and <clears throat> it's, uh, it would probably depend on the reader how they took it. I took it as kind of, yes, she grieves it, um, but kind of her realizing she has the gift of a beautiful voice uh, kind of cushions the blow. Um, but I think some people might take it as it's a little bit saccharine. So I'm not I'm not sure I would be curious depending kind of on the reader that interacts with the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been it's been too long, so I'm not sure I can uh, comment on on that one much, but um... 
but sort of what you mentioned of the the sort of beautiful song um this is a, a common trope, especially with blindness, called the compensation trope. And, um, or at least I, I think that's what uh, David Bolt calls it in his book, The Meta, Meta Narrative of Blindness. Mm. And um, so Victorians in particular seem to really think that, uh, that the body, especially with deafness and blindness, like that once one sensory um, element is, is impaired or removed that other things would would make up for it like you'd become a superhero if if you were blind and that sort of thing and it's not really scientifically or it's not accurate right um and and part of that is uh I I think in a way it's tied to sort of this deep belief that um that disability is, is necessarily a negative that it's necessarily a bad thing and therefore something must make up for it. Mm. And, um, and I think Gaskell uh, kind of does that sometimes in, mm. with her, her representations of disability. Uh, one really common way and um, that, uh, that Victorians like ha had that sort of compensatory uh, narrative was spirituality. And and even Harriet Martineau's life at life in a sick room does that, and that was like one way that that um, uh, invalids in particular, like like Harriet Martineau, could could claim agency mm -hmm. um, to to sort of say, well, I have this extra spiritual access, but um, but you know, it becomes a mixed bag then, like an assumption that that blind people have extra access to God or or that kind of thing, right? So yeah, it's it's interesting, and I, I feel like too with um, with Gaskell, especially with North and South, and and Mary Barton. Potentially, it's been it, as I said, it's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, that there can be um, that she sometimes invests disability with uh, class meaning, like you know, oh. it, it's. Uh, her her poverty and her conditions that make her blind, right? So mm -hmm. so her the tra the tragedy of her blindness is caused by the tragedy of the social conditions. And it's similar with um, oh dear, I'm forgetting her name in North and South. Uh, oh, I know the, who you're uh, oh. the the friend that Higgins. Bessie Bessie yes, yes Bessie Higgins. Yeah, and Bessie's another one of those ones too, who gets the sort of spiritual access through her, um, through her lung disability as well. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's interesting. There's stuff going on. <laughs> yes, yeah. and then interestingly, because of kind of the trauma that her mother experiences from the move and from this, you know, relocating while she is older. Um, yeah. it's, I think, it, I, I don't think it sounds like she was really vigorous and really thriving and healthy before that, but it just yeah. knocked her down several pegs. Yeah. Um, and she, you know, she doesn't really have compensation. She's just a really, she's her, her storyline is very sad. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's very like pathetic uh, yes. in, in the, in the sense of sad, but like, yeah, no compensation there. You're really tired yes. <laughs> out of that one. Yeah, it's kind of only the only compensation is that she gets to see Frederick before she yeah. dies. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I think that would be such a wound on any parent to have your child falsely accused of something and just it's decided that they're guilty and not knowing when you'll get to see them again. So, yeah, there there's there's a lot of stuff that people go through in North and South. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I want to say I I can't remember if it was like in a letter to Dickens when when it was being um, serialized, she she said that it maybe should have been called like deaths or something like that because wow. so many people die in North and South and she was kind of joking about how everyone's dying up but uh, yeah and yet it's such a happy hopeful book like that's you know how I was saying yes um, that that Victorian literature so often has that that deep sense of hope even in the midst of all of that tragedy yes no it's so true and um, a character that I empathize a lot with is Osborne in Wives and Daughters because I actually I have a chronic illness myself and so I appreciate showing that kind of 
just because you have the desire to do more than your physical abilities are, doesn't mean that it's just going to happen then. <laughs> um, and, yeah. You know, he really, he wants to become great. He wants to write beautiful poetry. Um, mm -hmm. And he just, his body is not letting him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about Osborne as a, a, a in that kind of role before, but you're totally right. Yeah. yeah, a friend, a friend pointed it out after, after she read it. And so it was, it was fun too, because, or I don't know if fun is the right word, but it was really interesting then, then um, when I reread Wives and Daughters to, to look at it, to kind of focus on Osborne um, yeah. as I read it. And um, that now I, I need to reread it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I also heard, this was interesting to me that apparently Gaskell she, uh, her daughter Mita, or Mita, I'm not sure how you would say it, but she had a somewhat kind of complicated personality. And so the characters of Molly and Cynthia are her daughter divided up into wow. <laughs> those two. Yeah, that was very wow. interesting to me. And it makes, it makes, um, I think kind of some readers come out of wives and daughters being like, Molly's just too good. Um, or, you know, Cynthia's too frustrating. That really puts a different spin on it. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yes. I'll keep that in mind when I revisit it next. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is my favorite Victorian novel. Oh, is it? It oh. is. Yeah. And I really, uh, it's funny, we were, you were speaking earlier about um, rags to riches, but I actually find kind of the riches to rags plot line more interesting. And so I feel mm -hmm. there's a bit of the Cinderella motif for Molly. And so her financial status doesn't change, but living with this dreadful stepmother she's not a wicked <laughs> stepmother but she feels, she feels so real um yeah I just there's a lot that draws me into it continually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. understandable yes this has been so um interesting and enlightening and I am certain that everyone will enjoy it so thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time to do this Oh, thank you. It was a it was an absolute pleasure for a Friday morning to to talk about Victorian literature with someone who loves Victorian literature. It was good. Oh, wonderful. And thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs>